Yeah, because it's 9.04. Well, thanks everybody uh, for, for joining us this morning. Um, I'm gonna get us started. My name is um, Erica Sparhawk. I'm the Deputy Director at CLEAR and the Administrator for Garfield Clean Energy. And welcome to our indoor air quality webinar. We're really glad to have everybody uh, join us this morning. Um, real quick, uh, a little bit about CLEAR and GCE, just to give you an overview, um, uh, especially since we have so many folks that we don't recognize um, and from other communities. So Garfield Clean Energy is a collaborative of nine governments here in Garfield County. It's all the municipalities, the county, uh, Colorado Mountain College, and RAFTA, which is our transportation authority. And this collaborative works together to implement clean energy, uh, energy efficiency, and transportation programming um, as to meet energy efficiency goals and as a way to diversify our local economy. CLEAR is clean energy economy for the region, and we're a nonprofit consulting firm that designs and implements programs. Uh, we work we implement the programs for Garfield Clean Energy, but we have other regional programs and a couple statewide programs that we've designed and implemented um, over the last couple of years. We started talking to Mary Wiener at Holy Cross Energy about putting together a webinar like this um, in late summer, as we knew people would be transitioning uh, into more people in their buildings and as we get to winter. And so I really wanna thank Mary and Holy Cross Energy for partnering with us on this. Uh, for the CLEAR team, we've also got Maisa Metcalf and Heidi McCullough um, uh, as part of this team. If you've got questions that you want to follow up after this webinar, um, those two can help you get to the right people. Uh, we call it Energy Advising or Energy Coaching Services, and um, we are happy to um, kind of be that interlay, uh, help you find the answers that you need. And I really, really wanna thank our panelists. We're gonna go through, um, you'll learn more about them on the next slide, um, but McKinstry and SGM, I really appreciate that you guys have stepped up to bring your expertise and um, your time putting together this presentation. And I hope everybody gets a lot out of it. Do you wanna to go to the next slide now, Sarah? So these are the presenters. Uh, you'll hear from them throughout the presentation. Before they um, introduce themselves and get started, just a couple housekeeping uh, for everybody. Um, all of our attendees are muted and your videos are off. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, if you can post them either in the chat field or you'll see a Q&A in the bottom of your screen. And our panelists can either try to answer those um, if it makes sense during that part of the presentation. So feel free to make this a, di a dynamic conversation or we'll um, save them for the end if it's something that's a little bit off topic from right what they're talking about right then or if it's answered later. And then at the end, if you would prefer to wait till then and ask your question with your voice instead of typing, and we do have a couple um, callers, uh, phone call folks, then um, uh, you can raise your Zoom hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question um, with your voice. So if you have any questions or tech stuff uh, throughout the, uh, presentation, go ahead and put them in the chat and Maisa will be monitoring that and she can um, help troubleshoot stuff. And we'll get started. Great, yeah, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Brian Johnson, uh, Senior Mechanical Engineer at McKinstry. Uh, my background is in um, essentially, you know, mechanical engineering consulting, um, as well as design build um, of HVAC, energy systems, plumbing systems, that sort of thing. And I'll pass it on to Tony. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Ashke with SGM. I'm a senior engineer. I'm also a certified energy manager and a commissioning agent. Um, my main tasks uh, are design engineering for HVAC systems like Brian, and also I do uh, numerous commissioning projects on all different sizes and types of buildings up and down the valley. And I am Sarah Parsons. I'm our technical services account executive at McKinstry here in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, our organization is a design, build, operate, maintain firm, and we focus on um, improving the built environment. And uh, we have a energy side of the house and a technical services side of the house. And on the TS side, uh, we focus on uh, services like commissioning, retro commissioning, active energy management, um, and facility assessments for capital planning and quite a few other um, strategic 
operations focused and asset focused um, services for our clients. So on behalf of all of us, we're very excited to be here virtually with you today and appreciate your time and attention to the subject matter and hope that we can offer some fantastic insights in this hour or so to come. Uh, in the webinar, we will cover best practices for operating your buildings in efficient and effective ways to reduce airborne diseases. So you'll hear us cover a bit about the properties of the coronavirus causing COVID-19 as well as other um, uh, viruses and of the various resources available to the facility managers to stay current uh, with all the recommendations and guidelines for operating your buildings. And we'll also speak to some of the technologies. They're not all new, um, but they are definitely emerging and gaining more attention and consideration since the onset of this pandemic. And lastly, we'll cover uh, some best practices for developing and implementing plans for action as your occupants return to your buildings so that we're all returning with confidence. So it's been quite an amazing year across the globe and throughout the pandemic, we have all worked diligently to keep current with these latest guidelines in effort to maximize the safety of our communities and for those who live, work and play in our buildings. And there's been a significant doubling down on best practices around maintaining safe distance from people, improving our general hygiene with hand washing, staying home when you're not well, and you know, just think about how many hand sanitizing stations have been deployed in the last six to seven months. And of course, the, the guideline for um, wearing masks when in close proximity to other, I know many of us are all wondering, um, when will I be able to step into a grocery store without a mask again? And of course, time will tell. But even before this pandemic, our nation and our world faces a dire challenge. And whether you're an owner or a manager of one or many buildings, and whether you work in municipality, higher education, for school districts, healthcare, or in commercial properties, it's full-time work to operate and maintain buildings and ensure occupant comfort and well-being. And despite all the hard work we do every day, half of operations energy in the built environment is wasted and half of the construction costs are wasted in our industry. There's 82 billion square feet, um, over 5.6 million commercial buildings across America, and we're using 77% of all the generated electricity in our nation, and 49% of all energy, which is accounting for 47% of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So while we work to address the health and safety of our occupants during this unprecedented time, it's of utmost importance, um, but it's also critical that we consider the ongoing operational and energy impacts of these strategies which we implement. Um, one thing also on that slide prior is that one size really does not fit all in how we attack what we do for our buildings and our usages. Now, there's numerous factors that need to be considered and addressed in how you combat the coronavirus in your facility. Um, the various differences between office buildings, municipal buildings, recreation centers, industrial buildings, they each have their own set of unique challenges that need to be overcome. Go to the next slide. Um, there's a wealth of technical resources for building owners and operators, uh, ASHRAE, OSHA, EPA, Center for Disease Control, World Health Organization, Underwriters Laboratory, they all have guidelines and those guidelines and resources are um, linked at the end of the presentation. But let's consider this virus. Um, the COVID-19 virus has several features that make it able to target drugs to break it down. The RNA is enclosed in a protein, a uh, spike protein and, and the uh, lymphid membranes. So a structure that affects the effectiveness of disinfectants in killing a virus are basically three different things. Um, small non-envelope viruses are hardest to kill. An example of that is norovirus. Or, and then large non-envelope viruses are more difficult to kill, like the rotavirus. Envelope viruses are easiest to kill. And that's like the influenza A virus, and SARS-CoV-2. 
Coronaviruses are envelope viruses, meaning they are one of the easiest types of viruses to kill with the appropriate product. That's why soap and sanitizers are our first line of defense. As they break down that membrane and the spike protein, um, the virus cannot survive without that envelope. So this is why they break down outside in the outside environment. Um, the difficulty in breaking down this virus is dealing with it in the airborne um, transmission of it. And Brian will get into that in the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Yeah, so we're going to jump into HVAC recommendations. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to talk about transmission of uh, COVID-19. And it's a, really, it's a really important framework to look at when we're looking at um, what, what we're going to adjust in our buildings and why. Um, so per the, per the CDC, World, Horth, World Health Organization, and others, the primary uh, method of transmission is uh, dr large droplet inhalation and possibly aerosolized droplet inhalation at close distances. So this is where our six foot rule comes from. Uh, when we, we talk, sing, cough, sneezing especially, it produces uh, a droplet spray. And if we are to inhale those at close distances, that's the, the primary method that's thought to transmit COVID-19. Additionally, if you're standing there talking with someone um, and getting those droplets on you and you go ahead and uh, touch your face or, you know, pick your nose, you're, uh, that's a, the, another primary method of, of transmission. Um, additionally, um, there's probable transmission uh, is airborne. So what we're talking about here is aerosolized droplets. These are small droplets, smaller than five uh, microns, that can travel a lot further and, and tend to not just drop out of the airstream, but can actually travel around for an increased amount of time and, and quite a, a large distance, um, as well as indirect contact. There's studies that show that um, you know viral RNA can survive on surfaces, uh, you know, 48 to 72 hours later. Now, now, what we don't know is, you know, are these surviving in, in uh, concentrations that are dangerous? Um, so there's definitely some more um, information needed there. So our, our primary resource for addressing HVAC systems is going to be ASHRAE. And ASHRAE's position is that the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through the air is sufficiently likely um, that we should make changes to the building operations, including our HVAC systems. Um, I want, I threw in another quote here uh, in white that is from the healthcare building guidelines. It says SARS-CoV-2 um, is thought, you know, to spread mainly from person to person through respiratory droplets. But notice this next line it says recent research indicates that SARS-CoV-2 is resilient in aerosol form and may be a more important exposure pathway than previously considered. So again, the framework is these large respiratory droplets are the primary concern and there's absolutely no substitution for wearing masks and distancing and hand washing. Um, when we're when we're talking about HVAC systems, so those masks and hand washing, those are those are the main um, ways to to combat transmission of COVID-19 in your buildings. So, in terms of HVAC systems, we've kind of grouped it into four categories for you guys: air distribution and thermal comfort, increased ventilation, increased filtration, and then some other air cleaning devices. Um, and we've we've uh, added some some descriptors there for the many acronyms we'll talk about in that category. Um, one quick note, as Tony said, really I recommend going to the ASHRAE resources. We're going to talk about these general concepts, but in terms of your building, there are specific spaces that probably have that need additional scrutiny that may have special considerations and. While these general concepts apply, I uh, really recommend getting kind of granular in your analysis of it, um, especially for healthcare. So most of what we're talking here is, is not specific to healthcare, which has really specialized needs, uh, needs to be assessed as such. So I'm going to start with air distribution and thermal comfort. And the reason I'm starting with this is that it directly impacts um, that, that primary um, method of transmission of those large respiratory droplets. Uh, someone had a great question about uh, the fluid dynamics and the breathing zone of, of occupants. 
And so I, I figured I'd, I'd throw this little picture here on the left, you can see this is our typical design strategy uh, in offices and classrooms and that sort of thing, which is overhead distribution. And what we're doing is we're targeting about 500 feet per minute of air velocity and we're trying to induce the Coanda effect. So that effect is essentially that air sticking to the ceiling and to the walls and then um, circulating in the space to induce mixing. So this is, you're not, you're not blowing air directly on occupants. Um, it's a, a lower velocity distribution method targeting mixing and you can see in this picture targeting glazing at the building edge. This is not going to be our primary concern with air distribution. This is fairly low velocity. Um, where we want to be concerned is where we're getting higher velocities than this. If you if you have airflow that's rustling papers at your desk, um, or uh, or your hair, that that's a concern. Um, but most distribution systems aren't a concern. Now, some of the common problems we've seen in buildings are evaporative cooling systems, say in, in large atriums or gyms. Um, these tend to use a lot more air and blow blow higher velocities. Um, sometimes there's sidewall diffusers that are, a, are targeting long distances, like 30 feet to the edge of a, a space, and that you'll feel the flow, um, as well as ceiling and uh, destratification fans. What you're going to want to do with those is either turn them off or reverse the flow so it's pulling air up uh, and not blowing down on people. Uh, additionally, you know, a lot of folks are adding um, air cleaners at their desks or HEPA in the room. And if you're blowing air across the face of an occupant into another group of occupants, you, you, you're probably actually not helping. Um, you want to be cognizant of that with portable, portable devices. Um, and someone also had a concern about return air, uh, mixing return air. Uh, this is something we definitely want to eliminate for specialized spaces, spaces. And what I'm thinking is like isolation rooms or nurses offices. We deal with a lot of schools. So those are a couple of spaces where we're going to go ahead and not return air and mix it into the supply air to distribute it into the building. Uh, but in other spaces, that's typically uh, not a massive concern at this point. The data shows uh, so far in the, in the, you know, early studies that, that this mixed return air uh, is getting caught in filters and is not a big uh, concern. Additionally, one note on thermal comfort, um, you're gonna keep your set points in the building the same. And if you have the ability to adjust uh, relative humidity, target 40 to 60%. Uh, next major strategy is gonna be increasing the ventilation. And what we're, here, what we're doing here is we're diluting the air with outside air. So we're exhausting building air and we're mixing fresh air. Uh, ASHRAE is essentially recommending as much as you can. Um, that typically is limited around 30 to 40 percent, sometimes more, sometimes less, before your system can't meet capacity and, and cool and heat the space. Um, and it's really dependent on system. Uh, some side notes on this, if you have demand control ventilation, i.e. CO2 sensing, go ahead and disable that or override set points. Um, you need to look at your energy recovery systems, make sure they're not um, mixing contaminated air. Uh, additionally, there's recommended pre-occupancy flush. And what this is gonna mean is disabling any optimized startup routines in your, in your systems and flushing the building with outside air before occupants are there. This is gonna clean the air, but it's also, if you're using an increased amount of chemicals, this is gonna be a, a good way to keep people's respiratory systems healthier. Lastly, if you have operable windows with no contaminant sources, use them. And uh, it's a good time to consider adding economizers um, to your systems if you have older fixed air, outside air dampers. You mentioned pre-occupancy flush, and there's a question about what about post-occupancy flush? That, so depending on which building guide you're reading, that is a recommendation is post-occupancy. So we have implemented that in schools. I, I sort of, my personal view on that is that it's, it's not as necessary as the pre-occupancy flush. You know, if no, if no one is truly in the building, um, I don't see why you would need to, to flush it. If you do have people in the building, consider, consider flushing it um, or keeping it active while those people are there, absolutely. Um, but I think that pre-occupancy flush is really the important one. Yeah, so uh, energy use note here, 
when increasing outside air, increasing ventilation is absolutely going to increase your operating costs, uh, potentially a considerable amount. So in the commercial building guide, there is a, a statement here that says, if there's significant energy impacts, use standard 62.1. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess the takeaway would be, look at increasing outside air, um, but you know, consider the impacts of it and where possible, um, you know, mitigate that, balance it, I, I would say, with your operating costs. So we wanna increase it, but maybe not to 100% because that's just not a reasonable ask. Um, some other notes here that uh, ways we've been able to mitigate this energy use a little bit is to consider your occupancy. So most, most buildings are going to reduce occupancy. Let's look at that CFM of outside air per person in addition to just you know per uh, normal occupancy. So if you have 30% um, outside air and you're at 50% occupancy, you're probably doing really well. Um, additionally, most energy recovery systems the systems downstream of those are designed to take advantage of them. And in a lot of cases, we can't turn those off. So a lot of times we're recommending we, we maintain those and keep them active and just um, assess the ceiling and make sure they're not leaking. Additionally, um, that two hour flush, you can look at it in terms of air changes and target three air changes. Um, and we've, for spaces with increased outside air, we've been able to lower that time a little bit, which is going to help your energy use a little bit. Next major recommendation is increased filtration. So uh, ASHRAE's recommendation is MERV 13 minimum, um, and as well as look at HEPA filtration where it's possible. Most existing systems are not going to accommodate a HEPA filter in them unless they're you know specifically designed for that initially. Um, so MERV 13 uh, moving into say 14 and 15 if you think your system can handle handle it. Um, and then we want to also make sure you're checking the filter bank seals on this. Uh, there's a question on, on, you know, what do we look at to, to know if we, if our systems can handle this increased filtration? And it's, it's surprisingly difficult to predict this. You need accurate as built, not design drawings. <laughs> Those are helpful though too, uh, and, and accurate product specifications, the original documentation. Uh, and the reason for this is we calculate a static pressure drop during design and it so often differs from what we actually are experience when it's installed. So um, it's, a, it's a tough one to predict. What we've seen is larger air handling units, rooftop units, anything with adjustable speed probably can accommodate it, especially anything with a two inch filter bank. Where we have seen issues is like VRF systems, little mini you know, ductless splits. These have a washable filter and unless they were actually specified with an additional filter bank, um, it's likely that you won't be able to increase the um, MERV rating much on these. And you can test it. You can take a pilot unit, throw a filter in before you buy filters across your facilities and, and, and test it. One note on the HEPA filters, there are some issues if people are going to try and upgrade to HEPA filters. Um, there's a larger pressure drop, so you really need to in increase fan energy use. Condensation can also occur across those filters, which uh, gives mold spores a place to grow. So that's why the HEPA filters that Brian was uh, referring to is more of a standalone unit to add that to an area as a standalone unit. Yep, absolutely. And Next discharge slide. to the outside is preferred. If they can do that. Yeah, so I'm actually going to speak to some of those energy impacts. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's not as as cut and dry as you'd think. Um, so what what we're what we're doing is adding pressure drop to the system. Systems with axial fans, these will see increased energy use and a drop in airflow likely. Um, anything pressure controlled, it, it's likely that it can keep up. It can compensate for that increased pressure drop, but it's going to increase your fan energy use. And then most, uh, many systems have constant, are constant speed with centrifugal fans. And for these systems, it really depends. Uh, what we see here is that the amp draw from the fan motor actually goes down, uh, but run times go up. So you're reducing airflow still, um, and, and it may or may not increase um, your energy use. Um, 
in, a, in the note, the takeaway here I would say is your, your main impact is gonna be the first cost of your higher efficiency filters and the fact that you'll, you'll need to replace them more often because they'll load more quickly. So we actually recommend you monitor, monitor these more frequently uh, after you upgrade them to get a sense for how quickly they're loading, how quickly you'll need to change them out. So the next category is, is some additional options to consider. Um, and and these, are, these are most likely addressing some unique spaces or some spaces where we're not able to get the amount of filtration, the amount of outside air we, we need, though we have had plenty of clients just apply some of these across the board as their main strategies. So the first is standalone HEPA filtration, absolutely effective per ASHRAE. Um, and readily available. The next is uh, UVGI or ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, also recognized by ASHRAE as, as effective. Um, this is a little more challenging application wise. And then the next uh, two options are, are ionization technologies. And um, while they're not new, they're, they're newly being adopted in the marketplace. And uh, there's some caution we would advise here as well as ASHRAE is essentially their position is that that these look promising, but we need more data. Um, and then one last note here, just be wary of, of widgets that just say they clean the air. Uh, you want to make sure they're safe and don't pr produce ozone. Yeah, note on the air cleaning devices, they must meet ASHRAE 62.1 2019. And that requires that they be listed and labeled with accordance to the UL 2998. So what does all that mean? Uh, basically, these air cleaning devices need to be tested and approved by the underwriter's laboratory. Um, a lot of these little cheap portable air cleaners that are at discount stores and retail outlets, uh, they're usually not labeled approved by UL 2998. They may have a UL tag on them, but they're not listed as UL 2998. So um, that could also include the bug zappers that you see that are like electric filters that can be added to furnaces. Those still need filters. Um, both of these examples um, end up producing ozone and, and the amount of ozone can be harmful to health and, and damage your lungs. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump into UV here quickly. Um, so, so UV, like I said, is recognized by ASHRAE as, as an effective technology, but its effectiveness really depends on exposure time. So this is something that's very difficult to retrofit into an existing air handler. So you can do uh, in-duct or in-unit um, UV, or you can do in-room. So in a retrofit application, it's likely that in-room is probably gonna be the better, um, the more effective solution. Uh, the air is just moving too quick and quick in most air handling units to retrofit. Um, and this, in my mind, this is really something that you're going to um, use for a special application, maybe a waiting room where you're expecting um, COVID-19 patients to, to be a probable um, source of contaminants. and uh, and what, what this is doing is it's not going to be visible to the eyes of occupants. It's going to sit up near likely a return grill and treat the air and treat the surfaces of the room as the air returns back to the unit. Uh, and it's certainly not a substitution for filtration. Like you said, Brian, the UV is hard to retrofit um, to existing equipment, but uh, one of the examples um, recently on some hospitals that we've been dealing with, our rooftop units are being manufactured um, and then sent to a specialty area to have UV packages retrofitted right to the brand new rooftop unit. And what that specialty UV section does is it, it, it meets the design of the volume of air, the CFM, and also the speed or velocity, the feet per minute of the air going through that rooftop unit. And then that rooftop unit is delivered on site and put on a brand new building. So when it's designed with the manufacturer, um, it doesn't affect warranty then on the rooftop unit, 
but also it, you can't just say UV is going to fix it all. It has to still be accompanied by, by filtration. So on these particular units that we've been seeing shipped out brand new with UV, there's a MERV-8 pre-filter, the UV, and then a MERV-14 final filter. And that is for hospitals, uh, one, of the, one of the few areas in hospitals that are going in this direction. It's my understanding, too, that the overall energy impact to implementing UV is generally pretty minimal, right? Yeah. Um, of course, you have the higher filtration rates. So you have to adjust the fans to, to recover that pressure drop. And I think the warning here is even though you have UV, don't let it be something you think, oh, it's a great fix-all. Your filters are still going to... Um, be your number one defense. Um, so maintenance on your filters, your coils, keeping them clean, uh, changing your filters more often is still going to be your number one defense. Yeah, next we'll, we'll jump into ionization technology. Um, this is, this shows a lot of promise uh, in specifically bipolar ionization is something we're seeing coming out, uh, companies are coming out with systems that produce low ozone and um, look and have, there's folks that have adopted them and put them in large applications such as Johns Hopkins that really point to this being a, a promising um, technology. I, I would just sort of warn that there's just not enough, you know, peer reviewed data to, to put a guaranteed stamp on, on the fact that they're effective. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to, to Tony at this point to really speak more to these ionization systems. Well, I, I feel it's a paradigm shift that we're in right now. Um, many of these technologies, like you said earlier, have been around for many years. Um, as a specifying engineer, these tests, I would like to, to specify these technologies more often. And in the past, they've always been value engineered out. Um, but now there's more awareness of what we can do with our equipment to make our buildings not only smarter, but make them safer. And so again, I think it is a paradigm shift to bring more of these products to the forefront and get more case studies and get them used in more, more spaces. Um, some real world examples of this are many municipal buildings had to stay open, their jails had to stay open, their sheriff departments had to stay open during this shutdown. Um, and so they incorporated the needlepoint bipolar um, retrofits to existing equipment. Uh, recreation centers were looking for ways to um, kind of limit their liability and at the same time uh, look for ways to add to existing equipment rather than trying to uh, revamp or replace equipment. So that's another area where we've seen this. Uh, type of uh, needlepoint um, put on to existing equipment. Now another area that uh, you brought up earlier were ductless mini splits, uh, PTACs, uh, small fan coil units, even ice makers. Uh, this technology comes with, there's little strips that can be added right to the coil and so then it can go across the coil and keep the coil clean. Of course, you still need filtration with all of these. If your coils are dirty um, and your filtration is not uh, maintained, then you're, you're going to have a, uh, a sense uh, um, of security that's false. You need to make sure that the, maintain, the maintenance is done almost more often than it has been in the past. And I think maybe it's a good time to also share a little bit of the challenge in getting a standard for this type of technology. And hopefully that, that this day and age is um, pushing for that in the industry. Um, as far as the UL867 versus UL2998 and some of the research we've conducted, um, there's not many manufacturers that actually have passed the UL2998 validation for zero ozone um, with these air cleaning devices, which is having um, less than five parts per billion detectable right. um, ozone. 
Whereas like the UL867, it's a 50 parts per billion, which is also still very, very low, but a 50 parts per billion threshold there. That opens up the market a little bit. Um, and then also when you're looking at this technology, um, understanding the difference in uh, needlepoint versus non-needlepoint bipolar ionization. But again, your um, options to fall within this, um, the guidelines here through the UL standards is pretty limited in the marketplace. So another type of ionization is basically photocatalytic oxidation, PCO, and also it's known as photohydroionization, PHI. You can see uh, induct installation examples on the left, and then on the right, you can see some residential examples. Uh, someone brought up a, uh, a question about what can we do in our residences? and uh, so this is an example that could be added to residences. It's basically UV light, but it shines on a catalyst like titanium dioxide, rhodium, silver, copper, and it's in the presence of airborne water vapor. So it creates ionized hydrogen, hydroperoxide, sorry. These ionized hydroperoxides are then dispersed into the airstream and attack pathogens, reduce VOCs and particulates. Um, the UV bulb, just like any UV bulb in any system, needs to be replaced usually annually, so it can be expensive, and it does generate some ozone. Um, one of the things uh, that is nice about these is I actually tested this in my own home and in my daughter's house. I bought a few of these, and uh, so just from personal experience. Um, my wife has allergies. We have two dogs and a cat. So there's always a bunch of dander and dust. Since incorporating this bee into our house, her symptoms have gone way down this year, especially with the added uh, smoke that was going around all summer because of the fires. Um, so we feel it's promising, but you know, again, more studies have to be done, and uh, it needs to be more case studies need to be implemented to really say, yes, we can put this in a standard and start using it all the time. Um, in specialized spaces, uh, one of the things that we're looking at in hospitals that had to um, create infectious isolation rooms during this pandemic. They need to follow the ASHRAE infectious room isolation room and the CDC guidelines um, for isolation. One of the things we recommend is schools should also consider adding an isolation room in their nursing quarters. Um, so isolation rooms are basically made by taking um, rooms that are already there and in hospitals they've put up plastic just like if you're doing an asbestos abatement. They'll section off an area of a hospital with plastic and then they'll use negative um, air machines. The best thing you can do is in these isolation rooms is have a bathroom so that the patient doesn't have to leave an isolated area to use restrooms. Uh, there should be positive pressurized enter rooms and protective rooms so nursing staff and doctors can enter and exit these isolation rooms and leave the um, the, the uh, germs there in that isolation room and not be able to track it back into the rest of the hospital. Um, and then the, they should target six to 10 air changes per hour. So you're, gonna, you're all gonna go, wow, that's huge. And most HVAC equipment cannot do that currently that's on hospitals or for nursing stations. stations. So, and a lot of these hospitals wanna use these rooms in a normal mode until they are forced to make some isolation rooms. So once it goes into an isolation mode, you can kind of look at the picture next, next uh, to the text there. Say that HVAC zone A, they can plastic off an area, um, maybe with, if they don't have outside walls with doors, they may have outside walls with windows, and they can set up portable HVAC systems there, um, set up, ones that will provide 100% outside air, heat and cool it, 
and then other ones that will provide the negative air and discharge all of it outside. So you're adding air in and discharging air out. You still can use supplies from the rooftop unit into the room for some of the air, but all of the returns have to be sealed off really good with plastic because you cannot have any of that return air going back to the main rooftop system and being redistributed through the entire hospital or school. So these are specialty rooms like uh, Brian had talked about and really need to, um, just the characteristics of it are, are very sensitive. So they really need to be designed ahead of time and a lot of thought goes into this isolation. Thanks, Tony. So it's quite probable that many of you have already embarked on the endeavor of developing a plan for action to address the heightened health concerns for um, occupants in your buildings and your overall building readiness. Um, but if not, or even if so, uh, this outline key, uh, this is um, outlining key steps to follow overall guidelines that are passed down from ASHRAE and the other organizations we've mentioned. So once you identify and assemble a key task force, the overall goal is to document the mitigation strategies um, that the facility is going to utilize, uh, facilities, um, whether temporary or permanent modifications, not only for your occupants, but for the facility operators as well to understand this play, plan. Whether you have already reopened your doors uh, to the community, it's likely you're still operating at a reduced capacity than pre-epidemic. So how well was your pre-epidemic operating conditions documented? And have you been thorough in not only implementing strategies, but also documenting these changes in your operations from the additional ventilation and filtration? And what have you identified as current operations versus potential future operations in this more post-epidemic condition that we will hopefully return to here in not too long in the future? And uh, what will you retroact versus what is going to remain in place ongoing as normal operating procedures for your facilities? So plants should include non-HVAC approaches as well as the HVAC mitigation strategies that we've been reviewing in this presentation. And I'll speak more to those non-HVAC approaches here on the next couple of slides. So for modifications to system operations, you will want to make sure you have diligently analyzed uh, appropriate engineering controls um, to utilize for these specific systems and truly improve the potential to reduce the virus transmissions in the building. And going through this plan effort allows you to uh, do pros and cons and evaluation of the multiple um, emerging and uh, advancing technologies above and beyond filtration and ventilation. And the best practice is developing this plan and to continually update the plan um, and your measures and strategies as they're implemented and to make sure that uh, you're communicating these updates to your occupants and operators alike ongoing. So we covered HVAC strategies and wanted to also take a couple minutes to review some of these non-HVAC strategies that facility managers are always ta also tasked with implementing. In the past few months, we've seen a shift in the numbers of people who are returning to the office space in commercial and municipal spaces. I've, I've seen, seen still much smaller than pre-epidemic numbers with only a handful of folks working in some of the offices that, that I've um, been, been in and around. And in healthcare, while we um, early on delayed those non-essential medical procedures, I believe those have started to pick back up now that we have broadly implemented some of these best uh, practices on social distancing and masking and schedule blocking. So eventually we'll see a full migration back into our buildings. And before then, we want to ensure we've addressed all that we reasonably can. You know, we have K-12 and higher education as some of the first uh, two market spaces to really test the waters with larger populations of students and educators returning this fall. And there's many different types of plans there um, that are put in place and being continually updated as well. Some of these items here. So maybe for folks on the call, you've done some of these by now. And if so, make sure that you're documenting those efforts. And for those who maybe haven't, here's some really great examples of minimal construct construction adaptations. 
you know, let's take like the building occupancy levels allowed. In the offense environment, you may want to limit occupancy up to potentially 40% and provide continual support for virtual and remote work. And when people are actually moving in the building, making sure that they're having that face mask requirement. I mean, that's what it comes down to. When we look at all this technology, this is all fantastic, but also your occupants should wear masks is the um, most current and valid recommendation. Um, and then have you considered implementing directional flow within your office spaces, considering like narrow corridors? And again, trying to limit that unfortunate opportunity when someone is crossing paths with you in, in a narrow corridor and has an uncovered sneeze, right? <laughs> Hey, Sarah, real quick, uh, we, we had a question come through about bathrooms um, and just what they wanted to know if, if, if we've seen questions or uh, issued guidance around uh, the use of restrooms. Um, from the HVAC standpoint, I just want to throw in there that, yeah, you, you need to uh, ensure that your, HV, your exhaust fans are running during all occupied times. Um, Restrooms are absolutely a source of these aerosolized droplets. The studies have shown um, viral RNA in fecal matter. And, and when, a lot of times when you use these flush, flush valves, you're, you're aerosolizing droplets. So it is one of the, the hot spots um, to consider. And uh, I think communication is key, mask wearing and, and possibly limiting uh, occupancy. Uh, I've seen people do, you know, little like occupied signs on the front of their doors and, and that sort of things for restrooms. Yeah, definitely limiting the number of people that are in there and standing and waiting in there and anybody who is waiting anywhere wearing a mask. Um, a few more ways to adapt the physical changes with minimal construction. Have you considered modifying your seating or removing seating to limit the amount of folks that can congregate in one particular area within your buildings? And um, what have you done to increase the cleaning protocols? You have your, your custodial staff working, but have you also engaged with your occupants to consider wiping down and providing them with cleaner so that they can do that as a way of um, packing out at the, at the end of the day um, before they leave every night? And then also, what's your protocol for verifying your occupants are well enough to even come into the, to the office? Have you developed a daily check-in to document where employees are, um, whether they're coming into the office, and if they are, verifying their temperature and asking them those leading questions about how well they're feeling? Um, my two elementary school boys are scanned each day before entering the building, um, and I'm also seeing uh, restaurants that are, are doing that before allowing people to come in and it's that extra layer of assurance so it's becoming a new common practice um, but but in, but a good one of, of, of course and then what about these public facing facilities that you might have are you considering scanning temperatures upon entry as well for those and um, as you have more folks returning just think about the ways that you want to relay these changes and the new processes for anyone who may be entering into your building one thing, Sarah, on the uh, construction sites, uh, I work on them a lot with all the uh, all the workers that are considered. Um, can't remember the word for it, um, but we're all working on these big construction sites, and every morning, everyone that comes to the site has to have their temperature checked, and then the hand sanitizer stations are added so that everyone can can use those. Um, I've just seen those everywhere, so it's just a, a note to make. There was a question on someone uh, about with the added uh, filters and UV, can you, in, can, does that make it safer to use return air? And I want to address that just saying, yes, it, it does make it safer to use return air and not have to use as much outside air, but it can still give you a false sense of security. Your maintenance on this, these uh, systems needs to be um, almost doubled, checking those filters, making sure coils are clean, and, and making sure UV systems are working. So I just wanted yeah, to answer that question. You beat me to it, Tony. I'd like to jump in on that one. Um, the So yeah, as you said, the UV MERV combo absolutely makes it safer to, to utilize mixed or return air, um, as well as the increased ventilation or just even proper 62, ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation. Um, ASHRAE points to a, a study on the Diamond cruise ship where they isolated um, people who were infected who had positive COVID tests uh, in rooms and there were people that did not have 
uh, interaction with these the infected patients, but breathed return air um, that was shared in all in all the other cabins. And in that study, which is very limited and preliminary, there was no infections found from breathing that return air. Um, that said, that was a system that had proper filtration and had proper ventilation as well. Uh, there's other studies where we see um, people getting infected and in a, in a lot of those cases, the, there was not even, uh, even you know, like a 10th of the normal outside air that we would provide with ASHRAE 62.1. Another quick note on that um, with the needlepoint bipolar uh, GPS is out of study and it's it's one of the newer ones that uh, actually approves it. Um, it's it's a laboratory study. It's not real life, but the FAA is running with that study and probably going to recommend that they put this into aircrafts. That's one of the things that's coming down the pike that they're gonna slow down the airspeed of the air traveling through the cabins of aircraft and put the needle point bipolar um, in the aircraft so that you get a, a high concentration of it because obviously you have a high concentration of people in the aircraft. So that's another technology that probably will come forward and be used um, in places you go that you might travel with. Thanks. I'm glad we could, could answer those on the spot here. So just a few more slides and then we can definitely open up for more questions, but I keep bringing them in as they come. So we appreciate that, um, that interaction. Uh, so, so what can you do, right? The deferred maintenance delays you know, the backlog of repairs to infrastructure because of budget limitations and lack of funding is a growing challenge for facility managers. Um, many of us know the compelling research that shows delaying that maintenance can uh, increase future costs and capital expenditures as much as 600%. So hopefully while your buildings were in low to no occupancy mode, FM departments were able to take advantage in addressing some of that backlog. Um, our recommendations are to dedicate time and resources to tuning up your buildings, verifying that set points and schedules are optimized. And with those higher capital retrofit projects that you may be considering, maybe even delaying, as you go to plan for new equipment, how are you addressing those additional assurances for the health in your buildings? Uh, we also wanna encourage you to check in with your local utility. As we mentioned, Mary uh, Wiener is on the call here from Holy Cross, so she might be able to answer any questions you have about some of the regional available um, applicable rebates from Holy Cross. And then for those of you who were able to secure CARES Act funding, make sure that you evaluate that triple bottom line return on your investment with uh, particularly some of these air cleaning devices like ionization or UV. Uh, the financial return, the people return, and the environmental return. And evaluating all the ways that you can allocate those funds to ensure the best mitigation to these disease transmissions. Tony, I'm not sure if you wanted to share any more on this slide. Um, I think I kind of covered it um, previously, um, but many times during recommissioning studies and energy audits, um, we're always saying look for the low-hanging fruit. Um, so obviously your first line of defense are those filters, the coils, um, optimizing your equipment like you said, checking, make sure those outside air dampers are working correctly so you're getting the correct amount of outside air. So all those things that you can do to optimize your equipment and make sure it's uh, operating um, to the best it can um, prior to looking to spend capital money is money well spent. Just do that low hanging fruit first. Right. And there's a lot that's on this slide here, but you'll be able to look closer at this in the post webinar follow up. We'll be able to send or share slides um, at following this. Um, but the idea behind this infographic is that sliding scale of cost impact for these best practices that you're implementing from low to high, left to right. And you'll want to, um, or actually, so have you actually gone in and audited and repaired your ventilation equipment? Were you able to do that? Because you'll want to address that along with improved filtration before you go to the market for bipolar ionization. 
Um, but on this scale, you'll see the potential cost impacts based on the type of measures and or equipment you're putting in place. And Brian, I know you, Tony, and I had a brief discussion about whether improved filtration should be on the higher side or lower side of that increased outside airflow, and all kind of agreed to, that, um, to place it where it is on this chart here. But would you like to share a little bit more about those associated costs um, on this on the higher end of the impact scale? Yeah, this absolutely has an impact on operating costs. Um, however, you know, you're, the nice thing about this improved fil filtration and increased outside air is you can, you can reverse this. At, at some point in time, I'm hoping that we are going to be out of epidemic mode in your HVAC systems. And so there's, there's a bit of a cost comparison here with you know, UV and ionization, those are, those are permanent systems that you're installing. And this filtration and outside airflow is, is absolutely a cost impact, but at some point in time, we can revert them back uh, to where we were. And I agree with that, Brian. The, the outside air, 100% outside air, is probably the most energy intensive. And uh, when we can revert away from that, this whole thing of smarter, and safer buildings by having some higher filtration or some UV addresses that. So any new, hopefully not, but any new pandemics or diseases that come out down the road, it seems like every year we have something or every few years we have something. Um, so then this is just something that's in your, in your bank of filters and, and in your building already to keep your occupants safe. We wanted to stress the importance of having a well-documented plan and implementation program. So here's a sample checklist that McKinstry shares with our clients regarding considerations for indoor air quality, building controls, mechanical systems, plumbing systems, and that occupant engagement. Operators and building management um, can use this checklist as a tool in which to prioritize those ongoing measures and to document when and how they've been addressed for your facilities. CLEAR will be sending this checklist to all the attendees along with a copy of the presentation after the webinar, so you'll have an opportunity to review these strategies a bit closer. Yeah, and ASHRAE has some great checklists I'd point out as well. Um, I'd just kind of like to stress the, the importance of that record keeping, you know, especially if you've spent uh, money on retro commissioning and really tuning in your systems and now you're going through and changing them to address coronavirus, probably one of the best energy savings measures is going to be to track the changes so that you can revert them at some point. One of the um, interesting areas for tracking is the maintenance um, tracking records. RAFTA probably has the best at their maintenance facilities. I review them um, monthly, quarterly, and uh, it's just amazing how they keep up with their maintenance and all their items there. Um, it, it saves them so much money by tracking things. And again, um, it, it brings issues up very quickly that they need to fix and repair instead of reactive and preventative. If there is a reactive, they're usually right on top of it. And then this brings us just to our last point, and then we can open up for more question and answers. And as we consider all the ways in which we are mitigating risks, remembering that communication is key and that it's best executed across multiple streams and platforms. So how are you engaging with your occupants about what you have done to ensure good indoor air quality at your facilities? You want to make sure you have educational signage in place to reassure occupants on health and safety measures, as well as signage in place to remind occupants, occupants about the social distancing, face masks, and hand washing, etc. And your facility staff and management should be putting educational signs in place to remind staff on safe operations, like the appropriate uh, PPE for filter changes and updating the procedures for filter disposal. And if you have or are planning to add touchless lighting and plumbing fixtures, you can also make sure you're doubling down with signage to show your occupants what you have done um, in response to this epidemic. And making a communication plan and assigning owners to tasks and the frequency in which those tasks are being evaluated and or updated is definitely uh, best practice. Within that plan, making sure that there's a communication protocol in place, um, particularly for any um, uh, emergency notifications that may arise um, as we continue to test the waters here with um, more folks more folks congregating in buildings. 
And then this one photo on the left is just an example of how we work with our clients to engage with their occupants on a deeper level, such as pledge campaigns and ongoing highlights of green initiatives and really getting the buy-in from our occupants and constituents that they will um, adhere to all these guidelines and, and enforce best practices. So if you haven't done so already, get creative to finding more ways to engage with your occupants and, commu uh, and communities and finding those silver linings in these trying times. I'd like to add one, one thing to that slide real quick. Um, Rafta was one of the places that had to stay open and keep people going throughout the Roaring Fork Valley. They had a really good COVID plan that they put in place immediately. And uh, a lot of it was social distancing masks and you know the the basics but um they they just they were like uh the leaders that, that let us all continue to move up and down the valley and just my hats off to them for their quick reaction to this this virus yeah, we did just have a question come in guys it's uh how can i find the amount of ozone produced by my purifier and uh, there's a note that uh, we just bought three large hepa filters for our community studios in carbondale uh, Tony, did you want to take this one? Um, the the HEPA filters, um, I would just caution if if you're just going to try and add them to an existing piece of equipment that may not work, you uh, your fans may not be able to push enough air through them. Um, as far as finding out how many, uh, how much ozone your plants can create, if it's UL listed by that 837, then it's under the 50. Um, if it's the 2998, then it's zero. So if it has that, those UL listings, you can, you can actually tell how much. If it doesn't have a UL listing to meet those two, it's anybody's guess. So more than likely it's producing very high amounts of ozone. Yeah, and I, I've actually had to reach out to manufacturers um, directly to get some of that information yes. um, hopefully it's published um, in terms of the HEPA filters that's great um, you know echo Tony's thoughts on that if they are portable in room just be cognizant of where you're you're blowing that recirculated air um, you know maybe point it in a corner and not blow it across uh, occupants And these are the resources I was talking about in the beginning um, with links um, for all the different ASHRAE, CDC, OSHA, EPA, et cetera, that you can um, find really good resources on all, all of this COVID related. Um, not only what is COVID, but how can we combat it? All right. Thanks, you guys. This is really great. Um, for everybody who's watching, we will send out the slides. Uh, we know there's a lot of resources. Um, we've also recorded this webinar if you want to, if you need to reference something in it and watch it again, or you want to share it with anybody on your team. Um, we have time. We've got about 24 minutes um, before our experts have to move on to other meetings. So if you do have a question, um, that you want to verbalize, go ahead and raise your Zoom hand and um, we'll unmute you. Um, or go ahead and start, you can put questions in the chat field um, if you don't feel comfortable talking. So we've got, we've got some time. Maisa, were there any questions that weren't answered in the, that were sent ahead of time? Yeah, I was just going over. There was one that I think we did not go over, which is, it was sent by Heidi, our CLEAR staff member, and she asked, is this um, PHI different from older chief ionization units that were, uh, are readily available? Yes, the bottom line is, is yes, because uh, this is, this is more of a specialized one that it's UV light, of course, and then it, it is um, used with a catalyst, the titanium or silver, copper, et cetera. Um, so it's a little different than just the ionizers that tend to produce ozone. Those are the ones that, are, that I warned about that are from the, uh, um, your retail stores, the, the cheap little ones. So really look to see if they're UV 
listed to 837 or 2998. Okay. We also had that one comment. Yes, I'm going back to that one, Sarah. So this was actually sent to my email from um, a CMC staff member. And he said, I hope that you will discuss the benefits of both types of disinf disinfection and their shortcomings, how filtration fits into using either. And when he says both types of disinfection, I'm assuming he might be talking uh, towards the ionization and UV. Well, uh, like Brian said earlier, um, with UV, it's really how long can the air stay um, in the UV path? Um, Needlepoint bipolar ionization is, is actually putting these ions out in the space. And they actually make some measuring devices now. You can even attach them to your BAS system so you can measure how much ionization is in your space, and it can have an alarm to BAS to go check uh, the, these, these uh, items that you put on your rooftop units if they're not producing enough. Again, it's, uh, it's fairly new, and we don't have a lot of case studies yet to say that um, how effective it is, but um, it's, it's not, as far as new and being implemented. It's not new technology. It's been around for many years. I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. We do have a lot of um, uh, CMC facility managers I see online, Garfield County, Pickin County. I don't know if any of you want to chime in uh, and share anything that you've installed or um, that you see working or New, new systems, um, feel free to raise your hand and we'd love to hear from you as well. Well, Brian, you must do a great, done a great job because they're not asking questions. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> and I have uh, to say, a lot of the participants did submit questions when they registered for the webinar, and I think you guys did a great job covering most of those. Great. Great. I, I'm surprised no one asked about smoke mitigation with uh, the recent fires uh, we've had. Um, right. one, one thing to note is that a lot of this, um, you know, especially the increased outside air, is completely um, the opposite of the strategy you would take for smoke mitigation. Mm -hmm. So it's something to consider. Um, and we've, uh, in some of our school work, what we've essentially recommended is to look at activ activity levels, but also consider like a low air, a lower AQI during pen, you know, this epidemic mode in your systems, consider a lower AQI at which point you cancel school or do distance learning. That is a, a, an unfortunate side effect, but should be noted. It's also unfortunate, uh, going back to the maintenance perspective, because then the filters load up more. Um, swamp coolers um, tend to really pack up as well. And so pads need to be replaced more often. Filters need to be changed quite readily more often, especially for hospitals. Um, anything that has to stay open uh, it becomes expensive. It affects the budget, unfortunately, as well. Great. All right. I don't see any additional questions. And I don't see anybody volunteering to uh, share any good stories, uh, which is fine. I know everybody's busy. So, um, oh, Mary Wiener just came in with a question. <laughs> Uh, she says, what about swimming pools at rec centers? Any study on chlorine killing the virus? I am not aware of uh, any. I have not. That's a, a really interesting question and will probably cause me to do some searching after this uh, webinar. But um, I, I do know that Co you know, coronavirus is uh, enveloped characteristics does make it more susceptible to being killed by um, by chemicals, and I would think chlorine would be one, but I, I honestly can't give you a, a technical answer on that. 
Yeah, yeah I, I think it's it's like you say with the envelope. Once the envelope is broke, the, the virus cannot um, cannot survive. And I'm I'm sure chlorine. Um, I'm not sure, but I would have to investigate. But I would think chlorine would do just as well as the hand sanitizers in breaking that envelope. Right, and right. the CDC does say that um, when swimming pools are properly maintained, the chlorine in the water should yeah, sure. inactivate coronavirus, but that there's no evidence that um, being in a pool is making folks more susceptible for spreading that virus in the water, um, whether it's chlorinated or not. Um, so again, it goes right back to proper operation and maintenance mm -hmm. um, and social distancing. So we just had two more come in. Uh, Chris made a comment, we've installed GPS and PBI units to our RTUs and taken every other measure listed in the PowerPoint. We've been successful. We have been full in person for K through eight uh, since August. That's great, Chris. Wow, that's great. Um, Jesse Porter um, asked, uh, we have had good result with having masks and having people alternate working from home. Is there a ratio of time slash occupancy that has been developed that shows what ratio is best. Can you repeat that last part? What? Yeah, so she's asking, is that a ratio of time occupancy that has been developed that shows what ratio is best? Like how many people for how long in a particular building to keep the risks lower for exactly. transmission? Yeah, since they're alternating how many people, they probably have 50%, yeah, correct, is what she said. Okay. Well, I think you addressed that earlier, Sarah, with the 40%, trying to keep the building around 40% and then change shifts is what's kind of recommended right now. Um, if you want to address that any further. I, I think in our uh, McKinstry offices, we've actually looked at desk layout and, and have come up, you know, look, looking at the floor plans, okay, how, what's the reduction needed to keep people distanced while they're sitting at their workstations? Um, I think typically that's been 40 to 50%. Um, additionally, another aspect to look at would be, you know, the HVAC system serving the space. What are you able to get the proper amount of outside air? And if you're not, consider reducing it further. Um, or if you are, you know, looking at that floor plan and and uh, as well as um, the communication piece is key. Um, you know, maybe you could go to 60 or 70%, but there, you know, if you're going to risk people not feeling safe, it may be better to still go to 50%. Something that also Sarah keyed on earlier at our offices, our administration staff, staff has teamed up to take different shifts during the day to go around and wipe down doorknobs, light switches, um, anything that's accessible to everyone, bathroom areas, uh, kitchen areas. And also it's limited. Um, we don't let people congregate in kitchens anymore. Um, we practice the six foot uh, distancing. People have to wear masks when they're walking through the building. They have to take their temperature as soon as they come in the door. Um, we have electronic documentation on that that we have everyone try and fill out for what was your temperature today. Um, so I, I think all those things together combined with HVAC, just right. get a good plan, like you said, create a plan and then stick to the plan and implement the plan. Yeah, thanks, Jesse, for that question. Um, and I also wanted to go back to Chris's um, uh, comment about installing the needlepoint bipolar ionization units in the RTUs. Um, and, and definitely in receiving of great kudos, I, if it's possible to share, um, what does um, successful mean to you? As well as how are you able to secure and allocate funding for that kind of capital endeavor? If you might and, be able to and most important, will you let us do a case study on it? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we got um, a couple more questions in the chat box. Actually, this is the Q&A box. Um, Aaron asks, when performing air exchange in our buildings, can occupants be present or should the space be empty? And the other question is, what's proper procedure given that winter's coming, which brings cooler air exchange a probability? 
I can I can take that first one. I, I believe that's in reference to the preoccupancy flush. Mm -hmm. um, right. You certainly there's no uh, added danger of of it being occupied by a person or two. Ideally, that is before anyone gets there, and and part of that reason is you're probably using an increased amount of chemicals, so just getting those smells out, getting irritants out of the air, and then um, just you know any leftover viral part particulate getting it out of the air um, but it you know if it's been sitting uh, overnight and you've had your systems uh, operating at a minimum outside air set point I don't see a huge problem with that okay uh, next question is I know this is about buildings but do you have information how to make flea and library vehicles safer she's talking specifically about van transport uh, I think there was actually a second part to that question, we, we, the earlier question we didn't get to. Can you re repeat it? Yeah, so I know Ziska, she... Um, oh, I think he's asking about Aaron's question. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, let's go back to that one. Uh, what's proper procedure given that winter's coming, which brings cooler air exchange a probability? Yeah, the cooler that, air means you just at 100% outside air, it makes it very hard to to heat and very high energy use. Um, so that's why the building flush in the morning is good. Get, get that out in the morning and then go to, to your um, increased outside air, but not 100%. And, and normally your, your, your buildings start in the morning, they close the outside air dampers and preheat. And that's what we need to get rid of. We need to actually bring outside air and flush that building and then go into a, a morning warm up, but we still need outside air. We can't close those out, those air dampers. Um, so it just means the increased energy use, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, Tony, the, the winter temperatures and heating dominant climates has been the, like one of the limiting factors when we've assessed HVAC systems. Right. Um, um, looking at, yeah, ASHRAE, may recommend 100% outside air, that's absolutely not going to work in a, a heating dominant climate um, in, in the wind, in middle of winter. So right. that's, we actually look at, you know, what, at leaving air temperatures at an increased uh, ventilation set point and making sure we still are going to be able to have the capacity to heat uh, the building. And it's also a challenge during that pre-occupancy flush um, normally you close dampers and recirculate giving maximum capacity. Um, you're going to use a lot of energy in that pre-occupancy and you may, your system, you might not be at your ideal 68 to 70 degrees when people come in, you might be more at 65 and, um, because of those open outside air dampers. So, um, again, communicating that to your, to the people coming in, complaining about the temperature is that this is, you know, you're prioritizing safety over thermal comfort. And that's why, you know, maybe looking at spending the money on increased filtration, UV or, or ions um, uh, may be more of a, a better solution because of our climate, because you know, trying to heat that much outside air is very hard. You know, all of these ions and things pretty much occur, occur naturally outside. And that's why the outside is more safe to, the, to this virus. Um, that's why restaurants have moved dining outside. That's why, um, you know, we see more that outside is, uh, is all right. Um, still want to social distance and wear a mask. So if we can get those ions in the buildings, if, you know, that could definitely reduce our energy use. So that's part of why uh, the, the paradigm shift to put UV and, and ion producing stuff on this equipment. And yeah, also, filtration. also a plug for HEPA filtration. You know, I don't think I mentioned this, but the way we, way we see it and the way we um, sort of size those systems is often as a substitute for outside air. So in the systems that just can't, uh, have outside air increased, consider the airflow rates in your HEPA, you know, portable HEPA unit, consider that yeah. as your additional outside air. That could work, yes. Great. Okay, so let's go back to the other question. Um, 
She's saying, do you have information how to make fleet vehicles safer? She has a uh, specifically van transport. So for example, Ubers, you know, if you're carrying um, passengers from the airport to a different location, is that like a specific thing you should be doing to make sure everybody's safe besides wearing a mask, of course. Yeah, obviously the mask is the most important and the social distancing, not packing people into vans and cars. Uh, Raft has been really good with their buses on the social distancing and the buses. Um, Uber cars, that's, uh, that could be a tough one. Um, obviously bringing in outside air. Um, have the, the outside air on your either heater cooling setting fully open and uh, try and use some use the windows, it's not always comfortable, but bringing in more outside air, I'd say would be key. Yeah, and you'll find more information on the NAFA, the Fleet Management Association, about how to adapt to that. Um, you know, you gotta use logic, which is um, sanitizing ongoing, and when you can have the windows down and flushing even the interior space before bringing other occupants in, uh, for certain, but again, the idea of avoiding packing in like sardines, um, especially with people who don't know each other, have not been in the same proximity. Um, I wanted to also share what Chris uh, was able to respond to um, the implementation of that needlepoint bipolar ionization in the RTUs and that uh, his school district was fortunate enough to have the CARES and other CARES Act funding and other funding to use for this, and that his definition of successful is um, being COVID-19 free and then having students plus staff um, mostly healthy all through the year. Um, and of course, the other factors at play, um, like being mindful of staying home when we're sick. It's almost ludicrous to think how many people we would socially accept coming into the office with a runny nose as long as they kind of stayed a little distance and didn't sneeze on me you know so we really each society has quite changed a bit here but uh, thanks for responding on top of that chris okay so we have five minutes left and uh jesse sent another question so let maybe just go over his question and then finalize our webinar so he asked uh, I have a building that had operable windows at one point. Would resetting them to be operable advisable so as to increase outside air? I personally am a fan of operable windows in a building. I, you know, I don't want to rabbit trail down into you know, biophilic <laughs> design, but it's it essentially increased. Um, uh, occupant control is a huge bonus um, and increases thermal comfort and then just increasing that outside air, absolutely. Um, I'm curious why it was changed to not being operable. There may be some liability issues or something that, that you have to consider with that, but from a, um, an occupant comfort and a coronavirus safety set, um, standpoint, yeah, I think operable windows are great. Um, definitely want to be to consider any um, contaminant sources. Um, look at um, you have any, you know, a restroom exhaust fan that's within 10 feet or is actually below windows, sidewalling or anything like that you want to, to, to look at and make sure you don't, uh, aren't bringing in contaminants by making them operable. But. Good point. Yeah, hopefully there's a well-documented reason, maybe Jesse, if you had been there when the building or when it was decided to make those windows inoperable, you really want to understand what ever mechanical design implementations changed or if there was retrofits um, uh, that were accounting for kind of the differences in, in requiring those to be non-operable. I have seen on some buildings where they've made that decision. Um, one was a school because uh, windows were left open and they'd go in and find three feet of snow by the by the window. <laughs> so I mean it, it happens. Um, just people forget. They open windows and forget. Um, so I, I can understand where some of these uh, things have been changed to be inoperable. But uh, yeah, I agree. I mean the more we outside air right now, it's very important. Great. 
Well, I think this concludes our webinar. Thank you so much, everybody who attended. Thank you so much, all our panelists, for sharing your expertise with all of us. Again, Clear will be sending out an email with the recording of this webinar, the slides, and some additional resources. If you have any questions, the slide right here has our contact information. Please don't hesitate to contact us um, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.